Chapter 1. A New Day. Zambia and Free Trade. Under free trade, the trader is the master and the producer the slave. Protection is but the law of nature, the law of self-preservation, of self-development, of securing the highest and best destiny for the race of man. William McKinley, 1892 The old is dying and the new cannot be born. In this interregnum there arises a great diversity of morbid symptoms. Antonio Gramacci Just a few miles north of Victoria Falls on Zambia's eastern border with Zimbabwe, there is a sprawling open-air market, market in a town named Maramba. It is on the edge of a two-lane highway that snakes through the city of Livingston, past the two new luxury hotels and at least half a dozen shuttered factories, which rise like mirages in the shimmering summer air. Long, uneven rows of vendors stretch far and wide, so if you walk from one end of the market to the other, you pass through a section of brilliant light, then shadows, then back into light again. Near the front of the Maramba market, under the leafless baobab tree, where a shallow rut in the dirt forms a footpath, Rose Shunzi sits on a warped stool on a February morning in 2002, with an angry tropical sun bearing down on her. She folds her arms across her waist as if she's been straight-jacketed, and rocks gently back and forth, her right foot tapping nervously in the dirt. Okay, she mumbles to no one in particular. I'm open for business now. This is how the day begins for Rose, a sinewy woman with deep-set eyes and sharp features that jut like a sphinx's from under her black headscarf. She awoke with a start this morning, and the primordial question that was her first waking thought is stalking her again. Will she and her children eat today? It is always a compound question. She has five children to feed and often there is not enough food to go around. Sometimes tough choices have to be made. Still, all the answers Rose is searching for today lie in the neat rows of tomatoes arranged by size, ripeness, and price on the wooden table standing at eye level before her. To buy enough food to get her family through another day, Rose will need to earn roughly, roughly 75 cents. If I sell my tomatoes, we will eat today, she says to me, matter-of-factly. If I don't, we don't eat. This is no easy feat. The 75 cents that Rose needs to make ends meet is about 50% more than she ordinarily earns from her vegetable stand in a 12-hour day. Moreover, the competition at the Maramba market is stiff. After it opened in 1952, the number of vendors there remained constant for nearly 40 years. Then, as unemployment swelled, it expanded to five times its original size within a decade. Rose is one of no fewer than 4,000 vendors peddling everything from AA batteries to zebra skin love seats to second-hand clothes. At least a do dozen women sell tomatoes just as red and ripe as Rose's. And although the tomatoes cost just a few pennies per handful, customers are hard to come by. Jobs have evaporated, particularly since duty-free shipments of foreign-made clothes began pouring into Zambia in the early 1990s, shutting down all four of the textile factories in Livingstone and its environs. No one has money anymore, Rose is saying, as she sizes up a woman who handled her vegetables but left without buying anything. The town has no buying power. Selling anything is like squeezing blood from a stone. The struggle of one woman in a remote African border town to earn what much of the world considers loose change reflects globalization's original sin, the doctrinaire opening of industrial markets to all 
corners has laid waste to local economies. Since Adam Smith published An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of Wealth of Nations in 1776, classical liberal macroeconomic faith has posited that favoritism snaps vigor from the marketplace. When Smith's ideological heirs at the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, IMF, sat down with foreign finance ministers to hammer out trade deals and loan conditions beginning in the 1970s, the first order of business was inevitably the willy-nilly disassembly of tariffs that protect domestic industry from competitive pressures. No country was a more enthusiastic convert than Zambia, a landlocked butterfly-shaped nation of 12 million people with a, with a land mass the size of Texas. Within 18 months following the 1991 presidential election of, Fred of Frederick Chaluba, a former trade union leader, the country dramatically reduced or repealed altogether its levies on more than 180 industrial products. Virtually nothing manufactured, bottled, or stitched together by Zambians was left un untouched in the overhaul. Had things gone according to the neoliberal blueprint, here is what should have happened next. Stiffer competition from abroad would have shut down some inefficient industries in Zambia but many more would have thrived as manufacturers capitalized on its comparative advantage, say topography or particular talents in the local workforce, to sell more merchandise to buyers in suddenly accessible overseas markets. Over time, liberalized markets would have reduced the ranks of Zambia's poor, first by expanding the number of workers participating in a modern economy, and second by driving down consumer prices, so that even when workers did not realize pay increases, they effectively earned more money by paying lower prices for the kids' breakfast cereal, shoes, and bicycles. Here is how it actually went down. Zambia was overrun with foreign-made products and lost 800,000 jobs over the next decade. Too fragile to withstand competition for its own turf, too embryonic to produce much of anything the rest of the world wants beyond raw materials, the country's manufacturing sector was cut in half. Zambians today sell fewer products to global consumers than they did half a century ago, when the country was a British colony. Eight of ten Zambians today survive on less than one dollar a day. In 1991, the ratio was 4 in 10. Perhaps the most remarkable example of Zambia's deindustrialization um, de is its textile sector. Used clothing began to arrive here almost immediately after the government repealed import taxes in 1992. Since no duties are charged for used clothes, customs officials listed their value at zero, wholesalers realized they could create a new market by buying surplus clothing donated to charities like the Salvation Army for only pennies per pound, then shipping them by the bale to sub-Saharan Africa, where they are sold at markups of, of, of as much as 400%. Not especially efficient, Zambia's textile factories were overmatched by wholesalers delivering affordable, passable clothing, often made with subsidized materials in rich nations, without paying production costs, tariffs, or customs. The 140 textile manufacturing plants that Chaluba inherited in 1991 had been whittled to eight when he left office in January 2002. About 30,000 of the industry's 34,000 jobs disappeared, according to the Zambia Association of Manufacturers, and were replaced by a loose but crowded network of roadside and flea market vendors beckoning shoppers to rummage through the pile, or salala in the language of Zambia's 
majority Bemba tribe. The bales of old clothing shipped to sub-Saharan Africa by the United States alone account for nearly 60 million in sales annually and are by now so familiar that entirely new idioms have emerged, partly in derision and partly because many Africans once assumed that the clothing belonged to the recently deceased, Ghanaians refer to the imports as dead white men's clothing. Tanzanians dubbed the garments dyed in America, and Zambia, the used clothing stands, are called bend-down bend -down boutiques. In the two generations since Africans began to free their countries from colonial misrule, Nearly 40 countries on the continent have liberalized their markets as part of the structural adjustment programs peddled by Western donors, such as the World Bank and the IMF. In doing so, the, content, the continent has abandoned the industrial strategies designed to strengthen the puny manufacturing sectors left behind by European settlers, transforming Africa into a dumping ground or for what the industrialized world no longer needs or wants, a deluge of second-hand clothes, used cars, old furniture, tools, and weapons. The continent's transformation into a giant flea market is the trailer for a very bad movie. From the African savanna to the Andean mountains to the American Midwest, global capital has taken a wrecking ball to the Rust Belt, its smokestacks, payrolls, and labor unions. The old economy favored production, the new economy favors retail, speculation, deal-making. Just as Chaluba bridged the gap between the two macroeconomic models in a single elect election cycle, America's political leader tra leadership traveled roughly the same political distance in little more than a generation, bracketed by the inauguration of two charismatic, charismatic skirt-chasing presidents, both Democrats. When John F. Kennedy took office in 1961, two of his top priorities, one of his top priorities, was prodding co Congress to create more factory jobs by rewarding corporate investment. Let's start that sentence again. When John F. Kennedy took office in 1961, one of his top priorities was prodding Congress to create more factory jobs by rewarding corporate investment in plant improvements and new equipment with greater tax benefits. 32 years later, Bill Clinton walked into the White House, practically inviting factory owners to set up shop elsewhere by pressuring Capitol Hill lawmakers to pass the North American Free Trade Agreement, which demolished the tariffs for products manufactured on the other side of America's borders. The shift is a critical detour from the path to prosperity, particularly for maturing economies. As the Norwegian economist Freit Greiner points out, no nation has ever taken the step from being poor to being wealthy by exporting, exporting raw materials in the absence of, domestic manufact, of a domestic manufacturing sector. Yet globalization's indiscriminate opening of markets has robbed undeveloped countries of what they most need for economic growth, an industrial strategy and kick the ladder out from under the world's poorest people just as they are beginning their ascent. Sub-Saharan Africa's 800 million people represent more than 10% of the world's population but account for only 2% of global trade, a share that is smaller than it was even 50 years ago. Since 1990, manufacturing activity has declined by a third per capita income by a quarter. During that same period, the growth of global trade has added nearly one trillion to global income. Shortly after I arrived in Africa in 1999 as a foreign correspondent, 
I began exploring a simple line of inquiry with academics, diplomats, and people in think tanks in Washington, D.C. and New York. Why is poverty so inert, so resolute on this continent? Why do Africans remain so stubbornly poor, their economies more primitive now than those of their parents? The answers most often proffered to me pointed to Africans' corruption, a cultural ethos that does not encourage hard work or education like the West's, and the continent's abiding failure to prostrate itself at the altar of globalization. But the facts I saw on the ground bore witness to an altogether different failure. This border town on the banks of the Zambezi River demonstrates how globalization got it all wrong, all wrong right from the start. Trade expansion does not trigger development, but rather widening trade follows domestic investment in infrastructure and industry. Africa in the 21st century remains in this sort of interregnum surfacing from colonialism's indifference, only to find its growth stunted again by another imperialist movement. We have made the mistake of confusing the free market with development, said Fred Mbembe, executive editor of The Post, Zambia's only independent daily newspaper. I'm not saying we should isolate ourselves from the world the way we once did, but we are not looking at how to develop our country. We are looking at how we can market our country to outsiders so they can come develop it for us. We are getting back to the same colonial equation where in the land of our birth, Africans own nothing, control nothing, run nothing. We are soon to be aliens in our own country. <laughs>